know, I get phone calls from, from readers all the time saying, gee, you know, all of a sudden I started getting these little, these little black bumpy things in my lawn. How do I get rid of them? You know, I have to explain to them, no, 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 no. Earthworms weren't natural to the United States of America. They were, and they got wiped out by the glaciers. Uh, and then along come the pilgrims, you know, and the ballast of the ship, and, you know, Johnny Appleseed, and, you know, the Oregon Trail, and, and people transport worms wherever they go, and whether it's purposeful or whether, whether it's accidental. And lo and behold, they came up to Anchorage late. You know, we only we didn't have very many people who were in gardening. You know, we, and so now, I mean, the fish in Anchorage, Alaska, they don't know what a worm is. It's, uh, but <clears throat> I can tell you that people in Anchorage, Alaska know what worms are now because we have them. And they produce this beautiful worm casting. And I have to tell my readers, no, 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 no. The reason why vermicompost, worm compost is so important is because that worm casting concentrates what goes into the worm. Now the worm is only eating the, that organic material, leaves and et cetera, et cetera, which they pull into the ground incidentally. What a terrific way to you know, get organic material in the ground. They're only going after a couple of protozoa and bacteria, maybe a little fungus, you know. Uh, I suppose the occasional nematode, I don't know. But they don't really care about the leaf itself. That, so that just passes right through them. They're not eating that stuff. And when it does, it increases the phosphorus and the, Oh my gosh, it's just, it, it is a terrific thing to have happen. And so when you have worm castings, that's a good thing. In fact, vermicomposting is a terrific thing to do. It, it helps you be sustainable, you get something for your garden. It's a fascinating hobby. Now, you know, every time I ever talk about worms these days, people say, oh yeah, but what about those worms in Michigan and Wisconsin that are eating, you know, and causing all sorts of problems, they're eating the forest up. And, well, you know, these are, these are special worms that come from Asia. Uh, one of them is called the jumping worm because it, it moves so fast. Uh, and these worms eat the duff so quickly, uh, you know, that, 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 that what would normally take two years to decay goes in six months. The next thing you know, a weed comes in, in this particular instance in Michigan, it was garlic mustard. The garlic mustard is, grows like crazy because there's no leaves to keep the seeds and everything from germinating. And it grows like crazy. And the next thing you know, it produces an exudase, allopathic to the mycorrhizal fungi that support the maple trees that feed, you know, wow. So the next thing you know, you don't have the maple trees. Uh, so you want to, you know, you obviously want to make sure you get good worms, that are the right worms. You don't want to introduce worms to your area that are, that are no good. Um, you know, and, and uh, it is a terrific thing. A pound of worms will eat a pound of garbage a day. And that produces a tremendous amount of soil, which is the best stuff you can ever use. Really terrific stuff. Well, let's talk more about that fungi stuff, because, I, I, you know, again, I mean, I, it struck me that these things are so important that I had to write a separate book for it. Now, I gotta tell you, writing a book is one of the most unpleasant things you could possibly ever do. Uh, you know, you, a friend of mine described it as sort of going into a rabbit hole. You go in this little rabbit hole and you're down there, you gotta be by yourself, you're researching, you have to remember where you put things. Where did I read that, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, it's, your train of thought is such that you, it's, it's hard, it, to be distracted is irritating beyond belief. So to, so to come to the conclusion after I swore I would never write another book again, that, that maybe this needed to be written about, you know, really, I think, sort of says something about the subject itself. And I really do believe that mycorrhizal fungi and the relationship they form with the plant, which is called the mycorrhiza or mycorrhizae, Mycorrhizae and mycorrhizal fungi are going to be the number one tool for both farmers and home gardeners. I, there's little question in my mind. I'm almost 70. I've watched all manner of thing come and go. Um, this is something like, uh, this is sort of the culmination in many ways you know, of everybody's soil food web dream, which is that you can, you can replicate the soil food web. Very hard to do. Uh, it's very hard to replicate from one compost pile to the next compost pile, you know, what, what you've got in terms of stuff, and that's why compost tea is controversial, et cetera. But in this instance, these mycorrhizal fungi, you apply the right one to the right plant, we now know which plants like what. Holy crow, the difference is night and day. It's that simple, um, you know. Uh, uh, 
and again, we, 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 we've got to get beyond the idea that they are ubiquitous, which is what, what really during the 90s, late 90s, and, and you know, into the 2000s, people started to say, yeah, mycorrhizal fungi, but they're everywhere. That's not true, particularly when you're talking about gardening. Um, how they, how they sporulate when they produce spores, which means how they propagate themselves, um, you know, is very, very interesting. And in a pot situation, they might do it every year. But in a garden, they don't. And in a farm, they don't. That's been the experience. And so all of a sudden, well, wait a second, we thought they were coming back. Every no, 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 no. Um, so you really gotta be thinking about these things. But when you see the pictures of A, themselves, these little teeny guys who are, you know, next to this big root going out into the soil. You can instantly see why they're so important. They're so small, they go out and into these pores and pull out this stuff. And then you see how they arrange themselves in the plant, inside the plant, not inside the cell of the plant, but they, they oh my God, they are the most gorgeous relationship and it's been going on for 400 million years. Now, I remember asking garden writers in 1996 if any of them had ever heard of a mycorrhizal fungi. I remember New York Times, Washington paper, Seattle paper, you know, not one garden writer raised their hands. We didn't know what mycorrhizal fungi were. And, and uh, you know, people I think now might know what they are, but I'm saying they have to know what they are. It's so important. It doesn't matter what you grow, other than those few that don't. It helps. It's phenomenal. You apply it to the soil and to the, to the uh, plant itself, yeah, if you can. As I say, I roll seeds in it. Uh, if I've got roots in a transplant, I'll roll it. But, but the advantage to also having it in the soil itself is that as the roots grow towards a mycorrhizal spore or propagule, you know, they, they activate it and poof, that you get a little, you get a little cell, a little clot of mycorrhizae, you know, and so you want to have lots of mycorrhizae all over the roots, not just at the spot where you first started. And so, yeah, having some of the soil is very, very important. Now, you've got to make sure this stuff is viable. And, you know, we've got to work on that. It's going to be tough because too much, too much heat can really impact them. Cold doesn't seem to, to, to be a problem, but if you have it sitting in a container, you know, in the back of a hardware store, you know, in Cal Southern California for six months, you might have some viability problems. So viability is always the problem. You see all sorts of articles. You buy this kind, it's no good. You buy that kind, it's no good. You know, it's, 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 you gotta test them. Uh, you gotta know the date when they were made. Uh, and, and you gotta treat them, treat them properly. And what's really cool is that you can grow your own. You can also locate your own. So all of this stuff is described in the book, obviously, which is out in September, uh, no, it's out in January. But, um, you know, it's not gonna be just this book. I think, you know, after you hear this interview, of course, if you haven't already started to pick up almost daily a story about, uh, you know, how trees communicate with each other, et cetera, et cetera, that's the mycorrhizal fungi. All of which really, you know, my attention was caught by two people, you know, one is Dr. Elaine Ingham. Uh, she's the soil food rep guru as far as I'm concerned. And, and if you don't know Dr. Elaine Ingham and have not read her stuff and followed her on the web, and uh, you know, the, you really owe it to yourself to do so. Quite a fount of information. The other is Paul Stamets. Uh, you know, his mycelium running was an eye opener for, for those of us that uh, you know, really weren't thinking about mushrooms and you know, fungus in that kind of a way. And, and uh, Paul's books, and he's got about eight of them, uh, his products whew, just just blow me away. Uh, you know, the, the, they both introduced me to the soil food web and to and to the mycorrhizal situation, and and uh, boy, I have to thank them for that. And I and I hope you end up thanking them as a result of reading the book. Well, we don't use manure tea anymore because uh, that's a little dangerous. Uh, you know, oh, it has the potential for E. coli, but compost tea clearly is something that yeah. I use all the time. Uh, and that's the new version of manure tea. The differences are twofold. One is you add energy to it to strip away the bacteria and the fungi and all the nematodes and protozoa. The other thing that you do is you, you can add a food to it to support either fungal dominance or bacterial dominance. 
And so you add air, you pump, and you, after 24, 48 hours, you, you, you have that tea. As opposed to the way you probably had to do it with stir your grandmother's big, fat, smelly, gooky stuff. <laughs> Lately, people are using compost extracts, uh, you know, which is, a, which is a, something that's been around for a while. There have been machines made. Uh, people have taken shop vacuums and created situations where you, f you stuff in the compact, you stuff in the compost, and you, f you shove air through it. And after 15 minutes, you use, you use the liquid that comes out of it. Um, you don't multiply anything, but at least you strip it out of the compost. You'll even use it as a spray or put it into an area where you're not able to put compost. Ultimately, of course, compost, I think, is the best, but it doesn't stick to the leaves, uh, you know, which is, which is really why you want to get the compost tea, so. These compost teas are very controversial, though, very controversial. I've got any number of pictures of my of before and after situations or with and without situations in my talks, and, and yet, you know, there are very few scientific papers. There are several, actually, I should say, but there, there are a few, uh, you know, that say, boom, best thing in the world, you know, that's because people think it's supposed to be a miracle. It's a replacement for fertilizer, is what it is, as far as I'm concerned. You know, it's not supposed to make bigger plants. Uh, it's, you know, it's so that you don't have to use artificial f fertilizers. Simple as that.